play Play something light and sweet and Orchestra, gay. won't you play something that is light mm. Something that is sweet And maybe you will play Something that is gay Something that is gay Oh, we must have music We, we must, must have music We must have music We must have music We must have music To drive our cares we away We must have music Play orchestra play Play something light and sweet and gay For we must have music We must have music To draw We must have music To drive our fears away While our illusions Swiftly fade for us Let's have an orchestra score In the confusion The years have played for us Serenade for us just once more Serenade us Life needn't be great Our love is changing day by day That life need not be grand. changing day by day. Although it's changing day oh, by day. What does it matter if a few old dreams decay? Play orchestra. We must have music. Play orchestra. We must have music. Play Orchestra Play, a song from Noel Card's Tonight at 8.30, a collection of plays for which he wrote words and music, in which he starred as actor and singer, and which he directed. If, as we examine his lyrics, we sometimes feel that he was not always a match for some of his American contemporaries in that field, it's good to remember that with Coward, the whole was always greater than the parts. As an artist in classic high comedy, he was the immediate heir to the tradition of Congreve and Wild and Shaw, and until Tom Stoppard came along, just about the only heir. His musicals are in the polite, graceful tradition of Gilbert and Sullivan and Daly's and the gaiety, and none the worse for that. Above all, his concern was to entertain, whether it was on the page or the stage, or in the cut and thrust of conversation. His clipped, spontaneous comebacks have become familiar chestnuts. Cornered by a newspaper reporter on one occasion, Coward was asked if he had anything to say to the star. He said, twinkle. <laughs> Trapped in a lift with an Australian woman who insisted that he should say something funny, he offered kangaroo. <laughs> to get back to the songs, here are some which strike his favourite notes. Cleo Lane sings London Pride, card in his most sincerely patriotic mood. The song was inspired by the years when London stood alone against the enemy in the blitz of World War II. Years later, Coward was to tell his friend Lionel Bart that Bart's musical Blitz was very close to the real thing, but twice as long and just as noisy. But first, David Kernan and Gemma Craven will sing A Room with a View, card at his most wistful and tuneful, the authentic voice of a 20s romance. A room with a view And you With no one to worry no one to hurry us through this gloomy fight. We'll gaze at the sky and try to guess what it's all about. Then we will figure out why the world is blind. 
We'll be as happy and contented as birds upon a the whole world pass before us while we are sitting other thing too. Room city flower every spring unfailing growing in the crevices of some London railing though it has a Latin name in town and countryside we in England call it London Pride London Pride has been handed down to us London Pride is a flower that's green. London Pride is our own dear town to us. And our pride, it forever will be. Wow, Liza, see the Costa Bella, the vegetable marrows and the fruit pile on. Wow, Liza, little Cockney Sparrow, common garden market, where the costas cry. Cockney feet mark the beat of history. Every street pins a memory down. Nothing ever can quite replace the grace of London town. There's a celebrated rivalry between some songwriters, but in the case of the, the really great ones, we often find a less publicized admiration and camaraderie. Just as Irving Berlin could write generously to Cole Porter, anything I can do, you can do better, so Cole Porter could parody Noel Coward, and Coward could put one Porter song right out of commission by changing the lines, weren't we fools to lose each other, though we know we loved each other, you chose another, so did I and substituting, though we know we loved each other, 
You chose your brother, so did I. <laughs> However, he could still cable Porter during the war for permission to rewrite Let's Do It and get the permission. This parody became so famous that people still lay bets that the song is cowards and not Porter's. Here, if it'll help to settle a bet anywhere in the world, is Cole Porter's tune with a selection of Noel Coward's lyrics. <laughs> Mr. Coward, we know, wrote a song or two to show Sex was here to stay Richard Rogers, it's true, took a more romantic view On that sly biological urge But it really was Cole Who contrived to make the whole thing merge Those famous writers in swarm to it Summer set and all the moms do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. The Brontes felt that they must do it. Ernest Hemingway could just do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. E. Allen Poe, ho, 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 did it. <laughs> but he did it in verse. <laughs> they say. But he had to rehearse. Tennessee Williams, self-taught, does it? Kinsey with a deafening report, does it? Let's do it, let's fall in love. The House of Commons on block, do it. Civil servants by the clock, do it. Let's do it, let's fall in love. Deacons who done it before, do it. Minor cannons with a roar, do it. Let's do it, let's fall in love. Miss Betty Davis can't quite do it, for oh, she's so highly struck. Marlena might do it, but she looks far too young. Excited spinsters in spas do it. Duchesses win opening bazaars. Do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. In Texas, some of the men do it. Others drill a hole and then do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. They say that Belgians and Greeks do it. Nice young men who sell antiques do it. Let's do it, let's fall in love My kith and kin, more or less, do it Every uncle and aunt But, I confess to it I've one cousin who can't Each tiny clam we consume does it Even Liberace we assume does it Let's do it Let's fall in love When Noel Coward first burst onto the London and Broadway scene in the 20s, he amused himself by telling the papers, I may say I have a frightfully depraved mind. I am never out of opium dens, cocaine dens, and other evil places. My mind is a mass of corruption. He was less concerned to emphasize the moralizing strain that runs through such a lot of his work. Poor Little Rich Girl was the first in a long line of songs which reproved the empty, jazz-laden life of the 20s flapper. Three White Feathers explores the predicament of a chorus girl who in traditional turn-of-the-century fashion has married into the aristocracy. Now she sits taut with nerves in the Rolls Royce which is taking her to Buckingham Palace to be presented at court. I can't 
can't help feeling fate's made a fool of me rather it's put me where i shouldn't be and really couldn't be by rights we lived at ealing me and my mother and father i've scaled the social ladder and i've never had a head for heights we had a pawn shop on the corner of the street and father did a roaring trade i used to think those rings and necklaces were sweet
most loyal audience, and one of his favourite targets was the British aristocracy, a class which still clings to some vestiges of its former power, at least according to the classic story of a hostess who consulted de Brett over the proper protocol in receiving the Aga Khan. The reply came by return. The Aga Khan is a direct descendant of God. An English duke takes precedence. <laughs> Card takes care of the aristocracy in the stately homes of England. The stately homes of England, how beautiful they stand. To prove the upper classes have still the upper hand. So the fact that they have to be rebuilt. And frequently mortgaged to the hilt. Is inclined to take the guilt. Gingerbread. And certainly damps the fun of the elder son. But still we won't be beaten. We'll scrimp and screw and save. The playing fields of Eton have made us frightfully brave. And though the Van Dykes have to go and we pour the bakes and grand, we'll stand by the stately homes of England. The stately homes of England we proudly represent. We only keep them up for Americans to rent. Though the pipes that supply the bathroom burst. And the lavatory makes you fare the worst. It was used by Charles I. Quite informally. And later by George IV on his journey north. The state apartments keep their historical renown. It's wiser not to sleep there in case they tumble down. But still if they ever catch on fire, which with any luck they might. The stately homes of England, they're rather in the lurch. Provide a lot of chances for psychical research. There's a ghost of a crazy younger son who murdered in 1351 an extremely rowdy nun. <laughs> who resented it, and people who come to call meet her in the hall. The baby in the guest wing who crouches by the grate was walled up in the West Wing in 1428. And if anyone spots the Queen of Scots in a hand-embroidered shroud, we are proud of the stately hearts of Coward was a theatre performer from the age of ten, prodded by a mother who was game enough to remonstrate when he was denied a place in the choir of the Chapel Royal. Nonsense, she protested. Has he not moved the Queen of Portugal to tears? <laughs> Later, he wrote movingly of his childhood, I never cared who scored the goal or which side won the silver cup. I never learned to bat or bowl, but I heard the curtain going up. A lifetime never dimmed his enthusiasm for the theatre or sweetened his acid. Two things should have been cut, he said of one show, the second act and the child's throat. <laughs> Time has convinced me of one thing, television is for appearing on, not looking at. When Card became famous, he in his turn became the target of monstrously ambitious stage mothers. To discourage them, he wrote his famous open letter, Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Tonight, to redictate it, we welcome our guest on Song by Song, Ian Carmichael. Put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. The profession's overcrowded and the struggle's pretty tough. And admitting the fact she's burly to act, that isn't quite enough. She has nice hands to give the wretched girl her due. But don't you think her bust is too developed for our age? I repeat, Mrs. Worthington, sweet Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Regarding yours, dear Mrs. Worthington, on Wednesday the 23rd, although your baby may be keen on a stage career, how can I make it clear that this is not a good idea? For her to hope, <laughs> dear Mrs. Worthington, is on the face of it absurd. Her personality is not in reality inviting an 
enough, exciting enough for this particular sphere. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Webb. Don't put your daughter on the stage. She's a bit of an ugly duckling, you must honestly confess. And the width of her seat would surely defeat her chances of success. It's a loud voice. And though it's not exactly flat, she'd need a little more than that to earn a living wage. On my knees, Mrs. Worthington. Please, Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. They said at the School of Acting she was lovely as Pierre Gint. I'm afraid on the whole an ingenue role would emphasize her squint. She's a big girl, and though her teeth are fairly good, she's not the type I ever would be eager to engage. That suffice, Mrs. Worthington. What? Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. <laughs> Another of Card's obsessions was the East. He travelled it, he wrote about it, he sang about it, and in wartime when he asked Winston Churchill what he could do to help the war effort, he was told to go out and sing Mad Dogs and Englishmen to the troops where the guns are firing. Well, by the time the war was over, he'd collected another vivid impression of the Indian Raj in I Wonder What Happened to Him. The India that one read about, and may have been misled about, in one respect has kept itself intact. Though Pakistan traditions may have cracked and thinned, the good old Indian army still a fact. That famous monumental man, the officer and gentleman, can still recall the glories of Bombay to Kathmandu. In certain clubs, you still can glimpse matured or embryonic blimps, vivaciously speculating as to what became of who. Though Eastern sounds may fascinate your ear, when West meets West, you're always sure to hear. <laughs> ah. What ever became of old Bosey? You know, I haven't seen him for a year. Is it true that young Briggs had to marry that floozy he met in the Vale of Kashmir? Chap in the blues, was it Prosser or Pycroft? No, Pym. Yes, he was stationed in Simla. Mm -hmm. Simla! Oh. Or was it Bengal? I know he got tight at a ball in Nepal and wrote several four letter words on a wall. <laughs> I wonder what happened to him. Whatever became of old Shelley? Is it true that young Briggs was cashiered for riding quite nude on a pushbike through Delhi the day the new Viceroy appeared? Have you heard any word of that chap in the third, was it uh, Sotheby, Sedgwick, or, uh, or Sim? You know, they had him thrown out of a club in Bombay. Oh. Because apart from his mess bills exceeding his pay, He took to pig sticking in quite the wrong way. I wonder what happened to him. Whatever became of old Tucker? <clears throat> Have you heard any word of young Mills? Yes, he ruptured himself at the end of a chucker and had to be sent to the hills. Oh. <laughs> they say that young Lees had a go of DTs and his hopes of promotion are slim. <laughs> but according to Stubbs, who was a bit of a louse, uh. silly young blighter went out on the south, took two old tarts into government house. <laughs> I wonder what happened to him. <laughs> Whatever became of old Archie? I hear he departed this life I say, whatever became of old Archie? I hear he departed this life. Oh. After rounding up ten sacred cows in Karachi to welcome the governor's wife. 
<laughs> I say. Yes? Do you remember young Phipps, who had very large hips, and whose waist was excessively slim? Very well. Yes, I thought you might. <laughs> well, a curious doctor in Grosvenor Square mm -hmm. gave him hormone injections for growing his hair. What? His hair. But he grew something here, and he grew something there. I wonder what happened to her. Him. Yes. You silly old fool. It was, uh, it was Coward who pointed out in private lives, the potency of cheap music. And for Coward, the composer, the key to the scores of his major musicals was the arrival in his head of a main theme which somehow unlocked the tunes of the other songs. Late one night in 1934, he was about to abandon one show, a conversation piece, because try as he might, he, he couldn't find the right theme. He closed the piano, had several whiskies, gave up the entire project and set off for bed. And he suddenly realized that he hadn't switched off the light by the piano. When he reached it, he played I'll Follow My Secret Heart straight through. Similarly, unable to find the key to the score of Bittersweet, he was caught in a New York traffic jam. In that not entirely silent circumstance, I'll See You Again popped into his mind. A third waltz, Someday I'll Find You, arrived unbidden in a Tokyo hotel at around midnight. Here are those three tunes, Coward's most potent music.
The late Philip Hope Wallace wrote, Never trust a man who decries the songs of Noel Coward. Cleo Lane will sing If Love Were All, in which he wrote his own epitaph. I believe that since my life began, the most I've had is just a talent to amuse. And equally apposite to sum up his steely will, fate may often break me meanly, but I keenly pursue a little mirage in the blue. Determination helps me through. David Kernan examines again the meticulously frivolous side of Coward in the saga of Mrs. Wentworth Brewster. But first, the last song that Coward ever wrote. He composed Come the Wild, Wild Weather for a play called Waiting in the Wings. It was beautifully sung in the play by Graham Payne. Tonight, it will be beautifully sung by Gemma Craven. I'll sing you a song, a 
It's not very long. Its moral may disconcert you of a mother and wife who most of her life was famed for domestic virtue. She had two strapping daughters and a rather dull son and a much duller husband who at 61 elected to retire and later on expire. Sing a hallelujah, hey nonny no, hey nonny no, hey nonny no. He joined the feathered choir. Having laid him to rest by special request in the family mausoleum, as the widow repaired to the home that they shared, her heart sang a gay te deum. And then in the middle of the funeral wake, with her mouth full of excellent Madeira cake, the widow cried, that's done. My life's at last begun. Sing hallelujah, hey nonny no, hey nonny no, hey nonny no. It's time I had some fun. Today, though hardly a dollar there, at least to set me free, we'll all have a lovely holiday on the island of Capri. In a bar on the Piccola Marina, life came to Mrs. Wentworth Brewster. Fate beckoned her and introduced her into a rather queer, unfamiliar atmosphere. She'd just sit there propping up the bar beside a fisherman who sang to a guitar. When accused of having gone too far, she merely cried, Funicule, just fancy me, Funicula. <laughs> when he bellowed, Que bella, senorina. Sheer ecstasy at once produced a wild shriek from Mrs. Wentworth Brewster, changing a whole demeanor. When both her daughters and her son said, Please come home, Mama. She murmured, rather bibulously, Well, who do you think you are? Nobody can afford to be so lardy bloody da In a bar on the Piccola Marina. Every fisherman cried, Beaver, Beaver, and Kay Rigazzo. When she stepped on the grand piazza, everybody would rise. Every fisherman sighed, Beaver, Beaver, Kay Bell, and Blazing. Somebody even said, whoops a daisy, which was a box surprise. Each night she'd make some gay excuse and beaming with goodwill. She'd just slip into something loose and totter down the hill. The bar on the Piccola Marina, where love came to Mrs. Wentworth Brewster, hot Flushes of delight suffused her. Right round the bend she went, picture her astonishment. Day in, day out she would gad about because she felt she was no longer on the shelf. Night out, night in, knocking back the gin, she cried, Hurrah, Fenicula, Fenicule, Fenic yourself. <laughs> Just for fun, three young sailors from Messina bowed low to Mrs. Wentworth Brewster, said Scusi and politely Gusta. Then there was quite a scene. Her family in floods of tears said, leave these men, Mama. She said, they're just high-spirited, like all Italians are. And most of them have a great deal more to offer than Papa in a bar the Piccola Marie. No. Life is very rough and tumble for a humble deserves. One can betray one's troubles never, whatever occurs. 
Night after night, have to look bright, whether you're well or ill. People must laugh their fill. You mustn't sleep till dawn comes creeping. Though I never really grumble, life's a jumble. Indeed, and in my efforts to succeed, I've had to formulate a creed. I believe. In doing what I can, in crying when I must, in laughing when I choose. Hey ho! If love were all, then I'd be lonely. I believe the more you love a man. The more you give your trust, the more you have to lose. Although when shadows fall, I think if only somebody splendid really needed me, someone affectionate. And dear, cares would be ended if I knew that he wanted to have me near. And I believe that since my life began, the most I've had is just. Noel Card always created a unique effect on entering a theatre. To know that he was in the audience sent a buzz of excitement around a cast of actors. He, he carried a feeling of theatricality with him, and to watch him touring the dressing rooms after a performance was to witness a wonderfully witty and sympathetic exercise in diplomacy. His last poem reflects the camaraderie he enjoyed, inspired, and wrote about so often in the theatre. When I feel sad, as Keats felt sad, that my life is so nearly done, it gives me comfort to dwell upon remembered friends who are dead and gone, and the jokes we had, and the fun. How happy they are, I cannot know, but happy am I who loved them so. Carol Brahms and Peter Greenwell, who, like most of us on this program, have cause to remember Coward's kindness and his generosity as vividly as his many skills, have collected 22 songs to remind us of Noel Coward, the jokes, the fun, and the songs. <laughs> songs we sung when love in our hearts was young we're in the shadows that we have to pass among by those songs that once we sung dance 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 little lady you is fleeting to the rhythm beating in your mind dance 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 so obsessed with second best, no rest you'll ever find. Dance, 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 dance. Mad about the boy. I know it's stupid, but I'm mad about the boy. I'm so ashamed of it, but must admit, 
The sleepless nights I've had about the boy. He never did that to me. He never did that to me. Though I must admit he wasn't a bit like what I supposed he'd be. Mad about the boy. It's pretty funny, but I'm mad about the boy. He has a gay appeal that makes me feel. There may be something sad about the boy. Mad alone, mad alone, where you go, my heart goes with you. Mad alone, mad alone, as you go down to the sea. When the storm clouds are riding through a winter sky, sail away. Sail away, sail away, sail away. When the love light is fading in your sweetheart's eyes, sail away. Sail away, away, away. Has anyone seen our ship? The HMS Peculiar. We've been on shore for a month or more, and when we see the captain, we shall get one more. And dogs and Englishmen go out to the midday sun. Why do the wrong people travel, travel, travel when the right people stay? Back home. What compulsion compels them, and who the hell tells them to drag their cans to Zanzibar instead of staying quietly in Omaha? I travel alone, walking down the streets. His eyes look out at me from people that I meet. I can't believe it's true. But when I'm blue, some strange way I'm glad about the boy. Chase me, Charlie, chase me, Charlie, over the garden wall. I'd like to wander for miles and miles, breathe and smile. Is at it again. <laughs> you were there. I saw you and my heart stopped beating. You were there. And in this first enchanted meeting, life changed its tune. This is a changing world, my dear. New songs are sung. Stars appear, we'll we'll gaze, gaze at, at the, the sky, sky and try to, to guess what it's all about. about. Then we will figure out why the world is world weary, world weary, living in a great big town. I find it so dreary, so dreary. Everything is gray. <laughs> We must all be very kind to Auntie Jessie. And do everything we can to keep her bright. Something very strange is happening to me. Signorina! Signorina! All the sounds I hear, the bus is changing gear. Signorina! Signorina! Any little fish can swim, any little cow can move. Ever claw uh, this odd diversity of misery and joy. I'm feeling quite insane and young again. And all because I'm mad about the boy, mad about the boy, mad about the boy. I wonder what happened to him. <laughs>
obsessed with second best, the rest you'll ever that the song is Cowards and Not Porters. Here, if it'll help to settle a bet anywhere in the world, is Cole Porter's tune with a selection of Noel Coward's lyrics. <laughs> Mr. Irving Berlin often emphasizes sin in a charming way. <laughs> Mr. Coward, we know, wrote a song or two to show Sex was here to stay. Richard Rogers, it's true, took a more romantic view on that sly biological urge. But it really was Cole who contrived to make the whole thing merge. Those famous writers in swarm do it. Somerset to know the more. Let's fall in love. The Brontes felt that they must do it. Ernest Hemingway could just do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. E. Allen Poe, ho, 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 did it. <laughs> but he did it in verse. <laughs> they say October did it. But he had to rehearse. Tennessee Williams, self-taught, doesn't. Kinsey with a deafening report, doesn't. Let's do it, let's fall in love. The House of Commons on block, do it. Civil servants by the clock, do it. Let's do it, let's fall in love. Deacons who done it before do it minor cannons with a roar do it let's do it let's fall in love miss betty davis can't quite do it for she's so highly struck marlena might do it but she looks far too young excited spinsters in spas do it Duchess's win opening bazaar do it let's do it let's fall in love in texas some of the men do it others drill a hole and then do it let's do it let's fall in love they say that belgians and greeks do it nice young men who sell antiques do it Let's do it, let's fall in love My kith and kin, more or less, do it Every uncle and aunt But I confess to it I've one cousin who can't Each tiny clan we consume does it Even Liberace we assume does it Let's do it Let's fall in love
Come on, let's do it. When, uh, when Noel Coward first burst onto the London and Broadway scene in the 20s, he amused himself by telling the papers, I may say I have a frightfully depraved mind. I am never out of opium dens, cocaine dens, and other evil places. My mind is a mass of corruption. He was less concerned to emphasize the moralizing strain that runs through such a lot of his work. Poor Little Rich Girl was the first in a long line of songs which reproved the empty, jazz-laden life of the 20s flapper. Three White Feathers explores the predicament of a chorus girl who in traditional turn-of-the-century fashion has married into the aristocracy. Now she sits taut with nerves in the Rolls Royce which is taking her to Buckingham Palace to be presented at court. I can't help feeling Fate's made a fool of me Rather It's put me where I shouldn't be And really couldn't be by rights We lived at Ealing Me and my mother and father I've scaled the social ladder And I've never Orchestra Play, a song from Noel Card's Tonight at 8.30, a collection of plays for which he wrote words and music, in which he starred as actor and singer, and which he directed. 
if as we examine his lyrics we sometimes feel that he was not always a match for some of his American contemporaries in that field, it's good to remember that with Coward the whole was always greater than the parts. As an artist in classic high comedy, he was the immediate heir to the tradition of Congreve and Wilde and Shaw, and until Tom Stoppard came along, just about the only heir. His musicals are in the polite, graceful tradition of Gilbert and Sullivan and Dailies and the Gaiety, and none the worse for that. Above all, his concern was to entertain, whether it was on the page or the stage, or in the cut and thrust of conversation. His clipped, spontaneous comebacks have become familiar chestnuts. Cornered by a newspaper reporter on one occasion, Coward was asked if he had anything to say to the star. He said, twinkle. <laughs> Trapped in a lift with an Australian woman who insisted that he should say something funny, he offered kangaroo. <laughs> to get back to the songs, here are some which strike his favorite notes. Cleo Lane sings London Pride, Coward in his most sincerely patriotic mood. The song was inspired by the years when London stood alone against the enemy in the blitz of World War II. Years later, Coward was to tell his friend Lionel Bart that Bart's musical, Blitz, was very close to the real thing, but twice as long and just as noisy. <laughs> but first, David Kernan and Gemma Craven will sing A Room with a View, Coward at his most wistful and tuneful, the authentic voice of a 20s romance. To worry us, no one to hurry us through this We'll gaze at the sky and run of the gingerbread and certainly dance the fun of the elder son. But still we won't be beaten, we'll scrimp and screw and save. The playing fields of Eton have made us frightfully brave. And though at the band I have to go and we pour the best and grand, we'll stand by the stately homes of England. The stately homes of England we proudly represent. We only keep them up for Americans to rent. Though the pipes that supply the bathroom burst, and the lavatory makes you fare the worst. It was used by Charles the First. Quite informally. And later by George the Fourth on his journey north. The state apartments keep their historical renown. It's wiser not to sleep there in case they tumble down. But still, if they ever catch on fire, which with any luck they might, we'll fight for the stately homes of England. The stately homes of England, they're rather in the lurch. Provide a lot of chances for psychical research. There's a ghost of a crazy younger son who murdered in 1351 an extremely rowdy nun. <laughs> who resented it, and people who come to call meet her in the hall. The baby in the guest wing who crouches by the grate was walled up in the west wing in 1428. And if anyone spots the Queen of Scots in a hand-embroidered shroud, we'll go the stately hearts of Coward was a theatre performer from the age of 10, prodded by a mother who was game enough to remonstrate when he was denied a place in the choir of the Chapel Royal. Nonsense, she protested. Has he not moved the Queen of Portugal to tears? <laughs> Later, he wrote movingly of his childhood, I never cared who scored the goal or which side won the silver cup. I never learned to bat or bowl, but I heard the curtain going up. A lifetime never dimmed his enthusiasm for the theatre or sweetened his acid. Two things should have been cut, he said of one show, the second act and the child's throat. <laughs> Time has convinced me of one thing, television is for appearing on, not looking at. When Card became famous, he in his turn became the target of monstrously ambitious stage mothers. To discourage them, he wrote his famous open letter, Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Tonight, to redictate it, we welcome our guest on Song by Song, Ian Carmichael. Put 
your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. The profession's overcrowded and the struggle's pretty tough. And admitting the fact she's burning to act, that isn't quite enough. She has nice hands to give the wretched girl her due. But don't you think her bust is too developed for our age? I repeat, Mrs. Worthington, sweet Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Regarding yours, dear Mrs. Worthington, of Wednesday the 23rd, although your baby may be keen on a stage career, how can I make it clear that this is not a good idea? For her to hope, <laughs> dear Mrs. Worthington, is on the face of it absurd. Her personality is not in reality inviting enough, exciting enough for this particular sphere. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Wilson. Don't put your daughter on the stage. She's a bit of an ugly duckling, you must honestly confess. And the width of her seat would surely defeat her chances of success. It's a loud voice. And though it's not exactly flat, she'd need a little more than that to earn a living wage. On my knees, Mrs. Worthington. Please, Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. Though they said at the school of acting she was lovely as Pier Gint, I'm afraid on the whole an ingenue role would emphasize her squint. She's a big girl, and though her teeth are fairly good, she's not the type I ever would be eager to engage. That suffice, Mrs. Worthington. What, Mrs. Worthington? Don't put your daughter on the stage.
most loyal audience and one of his favorite targets was the British aristocracy a class which still clings to some vestiges of its former power at least according to the classic story of a hostess who consulted de Brett over the proper protocol in receiving the Aga Khan the reply came by return the Aga Khan is a direct descendant of God an English Duke takes precedence <laughs> card takes care of the aristocracy in the stately homes of England Beautiful they stand to prove the upper classes have still the upper hand. Then the fact that they have to be rebuilt and frequently mortgaged to the hilt is inclined to take the guilt. To guess what it's all about, then we will figure out why the world is round. We'll be as happy and contented as God. the whole world pass before us while we are sitting still leaning on our own way we'll and someday the stork will bring this that and t'other thing city flower every spring unfailing growing in the crevices of some London railing though it has a Latin name in town and countryside we in England call it London pride London pride has been handed down to us London pride is a flower that's free. London pride is our own dear town to us. And our pride, it forever will be. Wow, Liza, see the cost of marrow, the vegetable marrows and the fruit pile on. Wow, Liza, little cockney 
Tony Sparrow, Covent Garden Market, where the costers cry. Cockney feet mark the beat of history. Every street pins a memory. Damn, nothing ever can quite replace the grace of London Town. celebrated rivalry between some songwriters but in the case of the, the really great ones we often find a less publicized admiration and camaraderie just as Irving Berlin could write generously to Cole Porter anything I can do you can do better so Cole Porter could parody Noel Coward and Coward could put one Porter song right out of commission by changing the lines weren't we fools to lose each other though we know we loved each other you chose another so did I and substituting, though we know we loved each other, you chose your brother, so did I. <laughs> However, he could still cable Porter during the war for permission to rewrite Let's Do It and get the permission. This parody became so famous that people still lay bets